Hi all, let's have a look at Leela in round 25 against chess 22k. So Leela playing white, the sets four ply, four half moves given, e4, c5, the Sicilian defense, knight three d6. Now Leela chooses against d6, the open Sicilian, d4. So c takes, knight takes. This is well trodden theoretical territory here. And three is played more usual that is popular but more usual is bishop g5 for example this continuation with an even position f3 though e5 knight b3 bishop e7 bishop e3 black castles queen d2 a5 things get very interesting here Leela plays the theoretical top move according to chess based live book which is bishop b5 uh, if a4 you might think this is uh, a move but really black has no problems for example bishop e6 this position is just very dodgy for white uh, because of d5 for example like this black can end up being actually significantly better uh, small edge at least so very careful white needs to be very careful how uh, this is approached is handling the a4 concern if white ignores that concern by the way this didn't happen then the form pawn thorn is actually very dangerous here this is weakening the dark squares with a tactical liability and unprotected piece on a1 and black for example i'll give you an example can try and make use of that with a pawn sack here to rip open this diagonal against the unprotected piece for example like this which f6 threatened uh, that protects the knight but look at this this is really an awkward continuation uh, even if this is needed to take that useless knight black can transition the advantage like this with a nice big advantage which is a theoretical line there so it's important though to stop a4 somehow so this is theoretically uh, being used a lot by a lot of players bishop b5 we have knight a7 and here Leela plays what I can only describe as it appears to be a, a very interesting positional theoretical novelty a TN only three times has this been seen before Bishop takes a7 in principle with the Queen on d2 if white's castle in queenside there's some dangers with this diagonal to factor in uh, usually like uh, 150 games I believe for Bishop d3 more than 115 and more about 100 games of bishop e2 but this there's only three games in chess space live book and Leela thinks it's important to do this give up the dark square bishop but what we do know is when Leela gives up a bishop for a knight like this often it's the other color which there's something wonderful that happens on the other color complex so here will it be a, a major lockdown of the d5 square rook takes a7 and now Leela just castles queenside no a4 or anything and I'm wondering if why this this isn't played could be because there's there's some tactical issue here without the dark square bishop a4 one might think is really dangerous however I mean this wasn't played queen b6 was played but a4 can be dangerous if the follow-up isn't correct here uh, if bishop takes a4 guess what black can play in this position if I give you five seconds to pause the video knight takes e4 yeah because this bishop g5 is pretty nasty which is why I'm thinking this bishop takes a7 is a, an obscured positional tn because otherwise of course it's nice to just give up bishop and dominate the other color complex of course everyone wants to play simple chess right but yeah this this is uh, can, this can be a horrible consequence if knight takes rook takes I mean black's just much better there uh, so this is very interesting if knight takes instead I mean the same sort of thing knight takes e4 here if f takes bishop g5 same sort of thing uh, so 
yeah very very uh interesting uh but there is a move here which I, as i say i think hasn't been estimated that much which is queen f2 also queen a3 is interesting but queen f2 hitting the rook just in time giving d2 for the knight just in time which means we get a magnus colson type maneuver against d5 which i've seen magnus colson use which is knight d2 to c4 to e3 to d5 this is chess made simple if it's actually technically possible to do this without getting cr uh, crushed on the dark squares so this important tempo gainer is a, is a square vacator as well. Uh, now here, if a takes, then that rook can be safely taken. So what does what does black actually play here? If the rook moves, then actually white can actually consider actually knight takes a four in this situation. And here white should be fine, big advantage for white. So very very interesting. This whole thing and maybe you know black's concerned about the rook and plays this artificial looking move queen b6 guarding that diagonal in advance but now white does play a4 in this position uh if g4 then a4 this position is too dangerous for white to handle because of d5 this is nasty with bishop b4 as a possibility so here bishop b4 this is too much for white to handle for example losing the bishop like that it's just too much um so yeah this is this is like really dangerous on g5 it's equally bad just d4 even if white takes on f6 taking on c3 this this is just very pleasant for black taking on a2 black's got a big advantage there so a4 is necessary here now Rook goes to a8. And now queen e2 with this positional maneuver in mind. Knight d2 to c4 to e3 to d5. <laughs> and I, I've seen, uh, you know, for example, Vance Colson against John Nunn against the structure. I asked Nunn actually about that. This is a bit of trivia. I did ask John Nunn about that, his encounter with uh, Vance Colson. He, he wasn't particularly feeling great that tournament. He, he said he had to be. He had to go to hospital during the tournament, so it might not have been his best day anyway. But Magnus, it was in a, a seniors versus juniors tournament. Magnus played this against John Nunn, who's one of the you know the UK's best theoretical, you know, best theoretical and, and tactical grandmasters, and now a superb problem solver, of course, winning many competitions in the problem solving field. But structurally, yeah, the young Magnus Colson kind of reduced a lot of counterplay by maneuvers against D five. This reminds me a little bit about that. So knight d2. But as I say, for me, the TN prelude, you know, the bishop takes a7. I think maybe a lot of professional players need to check this out if this is actually a, a legitimate idea to just give up the dark square bishop. It seems very direct and the promise of very simple positional play. So knight c4 was played, queen c5. If bishop takes c4, this position. Uh, should be okay pinning against the rook uh, pinning the rook against the queen pardon me this position should be okay as long as there's a lock and key on d5 why it's got a small edge so queen c5 we have knight e3 the positional maneuver against d5 trying to keep this bishop locked in for a moment knight e d5 and we transition into a position that i think anatoly karpov would love he's another great player structurally with these sort of structures where white's got a small edge, a risk-free edge, is a sort of Karpovian type position now. Uh, so rook d3, yeah, it's like white's got that such a lock and key over the d5 square. So let's see, queen g2 here, some positional maneuvering. And now actually, uh, potentially gaining space on the king side. So queen f1. Rook d3, a bit messing around. Now trying to gain space on the king side. And it's too dangerous for black to ignore this. If g6, then this kind of scenario is just too dangerous where actually the light squares are ripped apart. Like this diagonal will become critical. So for example, uh, like this, 
we can see the queen coming to h3 for e6 it'll be a killer diagonal um, the queen's in Siberia basically over there like, just as the king gets checkmated so that that's the kind of danger available if if this is allowed to go to f you know uh, f5 if g6 is needed because otherwise um yeah it's it's all getting a bit dangerous so e takes which has some clear downsides though they've got an isolated d pawn now uh h5 yeah celebrating space of voyage queen f3 black's trying to cause some trouble here but now e5 not minding about f4 at all even though black seems to be attacking f4 that's just totally ignored so why well if queen takes f4 it turns out here that queen d5 is strong uh with idea of like say rook f3 uh, now if queen f5 here to pin the knight then taking that is good and we get two connected potentially you know really dangerous pass pawns uh they look extremely dangerous why it's got a big advantage there um so if we go back to this position on bishop takes f4 e takes this is good for white a uh, very good example here and this position d7 is just too strong uh it's it's just a very very strong uh position uh, say this this is just refuted with queen a3 hitting the bishop and the rook still hanging it's just a nasty uh position to be in with that pawn on d7 and in fact with the bishop there there might even be possibilities like rook e1 coming up for rook e8 so that looks absolutely horrendous this bishop is actually very functional on b5 here uh, so yeah it seems all in all far too dangerous to take this f pawn we have d takes and then the tactical queen g4 trying to distract the queen away from d8 the back row issue would be exposed there you know taking then just to put this on the board it is a back row mate so queen g4 the queen's evicted and now f takes and black can't play this because actually the queen's eyeing c8 the so it's limited choices if queen takes e5 then again rook takes d8 so very limited choices here rook f8 rook d5 now another set of positional maneuvering to make Karpov proud centralizing look at the light square play rook, rook on the seventh uh okay <laughs> the bishop maneuvering now to d5 beautiful bishop which supports e6 it's absolutely nice elegant light square play uh Karpov had a magnificent game against Kasparov where he played like 15 moves in a row on light squares and light square masterpiece which you might want to find on the channel but this is just wonderful rook takes b6 yeah black's really getting it now uh getting in trouble uh so here yeah rook h1 and then we have queen d4 with the threat of pinning that pawn means taking here is possible so that pinned pawn so we have rook f4 uh queen c3 so again renewing the threat of taking the bishop check uh yeah so just to put that on the board just to show you you know rook takes h6 is possible there with that pinned pawn uh so we have check bishop moves out of the way bishop e6 uh now here queen takes a5 yeah white's just picking up pawns here bishop coming back to a strong point uh hitting h7 bishop comes back defensively the queen's coming off it's absolutely winning for white look at all these past pawns over here there's just no counterplay there's absolutely no counterplay here for black uh so these pawns are just absolutely uh decisive now uh yep three connected pass pawns is more than enough carries on a bit until both sides agree it's plus 6.5 for eight ply which is four full moves eight play the game ended here actually and is as an example continuation for you say rook d7 and the pawns push a bit further until they're absolutely decisive yeah, it's just crashing through 
so I'll give you the game end position so uh, I don't know what we have here is it worth gold this Bishop takes a7 or not because there's like 150 games for the Bishop retreating to d3 and 100 for Bishop e2 only three for Bishop takes a7 and yet the play after that seems very logical on the light squares uh, maybe the thing has been obscured by the need to play Queen F2 on the on the tactical A4 A4 move Queen F2 as long as one knows a few of the the traps this might be a plausible line Bishop takes A7 as played by Leela here so fascinating stuff comments questions like shares appreciated thanks very much